180 kilometers northeast from Cape Town, nestled in the Robertson Valley on the banks of the Breda River, lies Van Luferen. This fertile valley cradled by the Rufiesonger Ent and Langeberg Cape Fold Mountains is ideal for growing top quality wine grapes with ancient soils that vary from weathered shale to Karoo lime rich soils. Here, the Retif family is at the heart of its history. Very big hello and welcome to the Van Lofren, the next chapter coinciding with their 40 year brand celebrations. And of course, in line with the innovation that the brand is known for, we come to you virtually and live from our studio in Pretoria in South Africa. Now over 200 trade partners and media are joining us from a number of countries, including from Russia, the United States, from Brazil, from China, Nigeria. We say welcome to all of those people. And of course, uh, we have people joining us from all corners of South Africa. Big welcome. So here with me are the men behind the Van Lufren brand themselves, Philip, Neil, Henny, and Bustle Retief. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I'm gonna come and chat with you in just a second, but a little bit of housekeeping first. Uh, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions at the end of this particular launch. So please make some notes so that you can interact with the Van Lufren team a little bit later on. Let me go to Philip now, who is the MD of Van Lufren. Philip, uh, you know, I'm looking at uh, uh, the family, you, you guys as family right now. I can see who's who, but I'm going to leave the introductions up to you. You go ahead. Tony, yeah, thank you. Lovely being here. Um, I'm Philip, as you've just mentioned. We'll get back to that now. Uh, next to me is my brother, Neil. He's our production director, taking care of the viticulture side of things. And uh, he's good with people. I see one of his attributes is that he's very good with people. Any, my cousin next to him, uh, he's a, also a viticulturist and he takes care of a, another portion of, of the farming operations as a production director. And uh, he loves water and energy. So that would be his uh, speciality area. Uh, Basil is our cellar master, operations director. He's quick, he's, he's does very well on the operational side of yeah. things. He loves that. And uh, I would say he's uh, the joker in, in the team, yeah. When you say he's quick? It's decision making, operations, <laughs> okay, actions, uh, yeah, not, not fast, not speedy. So, <laughs> not speedy. No, not speedy no. Yeah, okay. He's, he looks the part though. He looks the <laughs> like, Let's talk about the part of managing director, which is uh, uh, what you are, Philip. You know, what are your responsibilities? Yeah, it's a long answer and a short answer. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not a big one. It's not an important one, but uh, there's a role to play. Um, I think it's keeping the, the team aligned. Uh, we've learned a lot over the last 12 months, uh, say as, as leaders. How do you adapt within the, the challenging environment that we've experienced? And uh, yeah, I think uh, keeping a calmness in the business was very important, is very important always. Uh, focusing on the future, future strategy, uh, also what, what the challenges throw at you and how you ad adapt within that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I love the, uh, the, the marketing and sales side of things as well as the, the financial side. So that would be my forte within the business. And uh, yeah, just uh, encouraging and inspiring the, the larger team. That's fantastic. Now, when you look at uh, the stats worldwide, very few family businesses ever make it past the second generation. Philip, how have you guys managed to, to survive, basically? Tony, something we're very proud of. A lot of things we can be proud of, but uh, staying together as a family in a family business, and we are now the third generation. As you said, I think less than 16% of, of family businesses do pass, pass that, that generation. Uh, many reasons why we, we get it right. Uh, I think one is that we always speak about us, not about I or me. Um, so that's a very important point. Uh, and to a large extent, we were brought up like that. If you want to join the business, then that was going to be where you will fit in. It was not going to be a unique, uh, separate uh, mm. identity. All right, let me go to Usain Bolt in the far corner there. Uh, Bustle, the, far, the, the, the quick thinker. Uh, talk to him about that relationship. Do you guys have a fight, do you have a squabble, and how do you resolve it if that ever happens? Tony, fortunately, we grew up next to each other on the farm, and um, we had our fights on the rugby field when we were small. Me and this one, my brother, we fought enough. We don't have to fight anymore <laughs> as yeah. we grew up. So now, um, like Neil says, we love us, we're not fighters. Okay, Neil, so Neil, uh, you know, judging from Philip, he said you're the, you're the people person. Are you, are you the guy that kind of steps in and calms everybody down? 
Well, it's not really necessary. We yeah. were brought up, as Basel says, lovers, not fighters. Mm -hmm. A lot of farmers would walk, wake up in the morning ready for, to pick a fight. Um, we go to work and looking for solutions, Yeah. Um, looking at the future and working together. All right, fantastic stuff. Okay, so uh, we've heard it from the boys themselves. Maybe what I should do next is actually find out what uh, your fathers actually have to say when it comes to this particular relationship. Here are the fathers. Ja, ik weet niet of het stout gaat. Ze zeggen, maar het gaat maar moeilijk goed gemaakt. En nee, en nee, en nee was... Uh, uh, hij was maar levend daar geweest. Een uh, beetje te veel pak gekregen misschien. Basel was meer kalm. En uh, Niel weet ik, was ook maar... Uh, hij heeft ook maar gegaan, want hij slag toen ons om hier een aand opgepast had. Het is zo geschreven. Dat mijn vrouw hem zo beet gekregen en ze heeft hem zo geschitterd en ze blijft stil. Toen zei ik, oh vrouw, als je mij kan zo schitteren, dan gaat ons weer moeilijkheid hè. Ik was van het trouw afgekomen. Toen was Niel al een, een matriek geweest. Dus ik kom hier, ik en, ben ik om in Marag bij de ijs. Nu komt Niel met zijn drie pellen achter op die bakje aangejaagd. Met iemand anders een bakje. Ik zei, wat is fout? Ik dacht, hoe jij, ik hoop je iemand te drinken. Ze zijn een paar bakjes in die rivier. Toen hebben we die boot aangehaakt en hij kon die boot lekker aanhaken. En hij Niel sprong zo uit, uit om hem te gaan helpen. En hij vergeet om die bakje in de rat te zetten. En toen begon hij achteruit te lopen. En hij loopt met die boot in alle in rivier. En ik daar gekomen. En ik zei, waar is die bakje? En hij leidt daar onder. <laughs> Ja, ik heb zijn eigen job. Zo, uh, hij heeft geen botsende belangen. Nie. Hulle, hulle, die een maakt wijn en die andere een kijkt naar die financiën en die andere een kijkt naar de linkerkant te plaatsen en die andere een naar de rechterkant te plaatsen. So, ik zie ze altijd botsende belangen. Nie. Well, so there it is. So wow, the Retiefs are very different indeed. And perhaps their strength lies in exactly that, that they're very different. And so they rely on that individuality. So the four of them are the current generation, the driving force behind Van Lufren. Uh, gentlemen, one thing I noticed in that particular story there with your dad is that there's no mention of Philip at all. Were you a saint when you were growing up? No, what did I always say? Because the... Uh he left it for later, or what? Or what? <laughs> yeah. He left it all for much yeah, later. Yeah. Okay. No, I was a bit of a head boy, boykie probably mm. then, but uh, that's just what. That, uh, maybe they didn't think of a nice story they could tell. Yeah, uh, the rest oh. of us were naughty enough. They were, <laughs> all right, fantastic guys. Okay, let's uh, let's talk about your dads. So are they are they still in the business with you, Philip? Uh, they very much still live on the farm. Uh, they're not operationally or strategically involved. Uh, they do pop in. Mm -hmm. uh, they, 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 uh, so they're involved from a, a guidance perspective, uh, perspective and they are yeah, uh, endearing to the larger team. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's a very important involvement. And yeah, it's wonderful, wonderful for us to be able to still have them around. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, Henny, I can, I can envision a situation where you actually go back to your, to your, to your dad or maybe to your uncle for a little bit of uh, advice. Yes, Tony, I was very lucky. I was the first one on the farm. And so I had this opportunity. I had both of their, uh, their time. And what the nicest thing was at, in the evenings after work, there was a rondowel on the farm. Mm -hmm. And there we made many plans for the future. Okay, so you sit with them and come up with plans and so forth. All right, fantastic. Now, uh, Uum Nico and Uum Venant's contribution to Van Lufren's journey is, of course, a special one, as you can hear from the boys here. Uh, they still love being involved in the farm. So let's have a look and also find out how the staff members experience their valued presence after all these years. Ik ga naar die post nog. Het is niet meer bij je niet, want het is maar die post raak al hoe minder. En maar eindelijk is het om die kranten niet aan te krijgen. Dan kijk ik maar net naar die die plaatsen tien een beetje. Die laat ik aan werken. Dat is me zo bezig wat aan werk. En dan gaat zo'n klein groente tientje. Maar verder rij ik maar net rond op die plaatsen voor die mooie. 
Ik is nog, uh, ik heb het trokken bij de kelder. Ik kom in week een paar keer uh, draai maken in de kelder, proef die jonge wijnen. En die helpt ze nou dan met die brains ook op te En verder speel ik golf en rij rond. Om Wijnand. Hier is ons vaak al personal press cutting service. So on a Monday I'd get into the office and there will lie a stack of papers and whichever of our wines were advertised over the weekend or interesting articles that appeared would be waiting for me. Appa Nikkel is een van ons gunsteling mense. Um, as hy instap by ons prolokaal by Van Loofren en as hy die kliënte sien, sal hy stap na hulle toe, so bykie uitvra en ook hulle glas is vol skink. En dan zal hij altijd uitvragen van balen komen en zo bij met die familie geschiedenis begin. So, het is altijd lekker om bijna in de kelder te zien. Het is altijd gemakkelijk om te komen proeven samen met jou. En het is baie lekker om voor je in de kelder te zien samen met ons. Uncle Nico is voor mij like uh, Father Christmas. Hij likes to spoil us. Sometimes he brings us some cook sisters, some pies. Hij is dus very generous en nice. So, fantastic words there coming through from some of the staff members. Let's get to the nuts and bolts of uh, the issue here. Now, Philip has been the managing director for the past 15 years. Uh, Philip, I want to come to you to talk about uh, the relaunch, the rebranding to a certain extent. This is not, uh, this started, this is a process that started for you about 18 months ago, isn't it? Yes, Tony, it's, a, it's an important decision any time that you do change your, your packaging or your, or your look and feel, if you can put it that way. And uh, we started our process 18 months ago as a small team with some consultants. Um, and we've diligently worked through that and then COVID happened and we continued. Um, and at the right time, we started sharing that with our, our, our colleagues, with the family, and we, get, we got the buy-in, uh, tweaked it a bit. Um, and yeah, today is about, about uh, treasuring and also cap capturing uh, our, our stories and our memories uh, into our, our, our new packaging and, and the launch. And Neil, one of the critical things when you, you know, you make such big decisions and such big changes is you still have to keep, uh, take cognizance of the legacy that comes, you know, with the brand like Van, uh, Van Lovren. Well, I think every time um, you see something new, um, for, for first is a shock after years changing a label. But as it grew on us, the new packaging, I think everyone fell in love with it and um, is happy with the change and looking forward to how the public is going to receive it. Uh, Bustle, when it comes to, 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 to this particular re relaunch, I mean, wh wh where do you guys feature yourself and Henny, your participation in all this? Because uh, you're almost like the nuts and bolts of uh, everything that, that we're seeing here in the, uh, when it comes to the brand. Well, I was fortunate. I'm normally the one that talked out and I was told to keep quiet about the launch of the new, new brand. and. Um, I was fortunate that uh, Philip and Bonita keep me in the loops with the new with the new developments. And um, I was from the start when we got to the VRL. I was so um, impressed and happy with the change that uh, mm. yeah, it's just fantastic. Okay, so uh, Bustle, when it comes to the entrepreneurial spirit, that started way back in 1937. Is that correct? Yes, it started with our grandfather. In 1937, you must remember, we didn't have electricity in the Robertson area. So we had to think out of the box when he had to make wine. Otherwise, he could only make the stilling wine, uh, for which he wouldn't have received a lot of money. So he used spirits to fortify his wine, and then he made sweet fortified wines. And uh, when our parents, my uncle and my dad, came to the farm in 1976, they luckily had electricity on the farm, and they started doing cold fermentation. And in 1980, they um, launched their first wine. It was called the uh, Van Loeferen Premier Grand Cru. And they always, uh, also in the 80s, they planted noble varietals like Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc. And then it was in around about 84 till 92 that we as cousins um, had to do wine tastings in the garden, in my grandmother's garden with our parents every second week. And it is here that we learned what the consumers want. At that stage, we didn't have red wine. So our consumers always ask us, but when are you bringing out red wine? And when Henny went to Stellenbosch, he did research on red varietals that will work in the Robertson area. And when I finished my studies in 93 and came, joined Henny on the farm, I was fortunate to have grapes to do 
um, tests on. And then in 1995, we launched our first uh, red wine that was called River Red. And I would say that's where our entrepreneurial uh, spirit started, was listening to the consumers, observing and watching our parents and remembering our grandparents. Well, well put, well put. Well, I suppose that leads to the next very obvious question. Uh, you know, Henny, you're the Retief family. Why not call the farm uh, the Retief farm? Where does the name Van Lofren come from? Tony, in 1699, a lady came to South Africa. Her name was Christina Van Lofren. With her, she brought a suitcase or trousseau kist, and that kist landed up in my grandma's possession. And when my grandma moved to the farm, she said she preferred the name Van Lofren, so she called the farm Van Lofren. My grandma loved planting trees, flowers, etc. So first she did, or next to the roads, she planted this red rose of scarlet canna. So we've got this beautiful rose of cannas along the road. So when you come and visit us, you see these flowers. And then in the garden, she planted trees for many occasions. She planted, for instance, in 1945, she planted for the well, end of World War II, she planted the Norfolk pine for Japan and a New Caledonian pine for Germany. When Nelson Mandela got president, she also planted him a leopard tree. And when us four finished our studies, she planted a reach for the sky or a feather duster for each of us. And whenever you're in the area, come in, come and drink some wine and eat some food and walk around the garden and look at all these trees. Fantastic story, fantastic story. I I'm gonna take you up on that. And can you also include a bit of wine tasting for me? Yes. Yes. That's a clear <laughs> answer for me. <laughs> uh, so what we're witnessing is a golden thread that's run through Van Lufren's new vision for their brand. And that new vision is about to become a reality. From every row of vines planted to every laugh shared around the table and to every legacy left behind as a reminder of where we have come from. We love every story. We are deeply connected to our history, so it was only appropriate that the inspiration for our new direction would reveal itself in the stories found across the Van Lofren winery. The first clue to our new brand direction was hiding in plain sight. An old cabinet held the original invitation to an important event in our brand history, the wedding of our grandparents, Henny Retief and Jean van Sale. The diamond-shaped emblem on the invitation was used to symbolically unite the two families together, and it was this union that would lead Oma Jean naming the farm after one of her ancestors, Christina van Wufferen. And in that moment, the realization that by combining the letters from each family, the new Van Lofren brand mark VRL was revealed. Defined by clean, simple and thoughtful design elements, the new brand mark forms the inspiration for the new pack upgrade. The Van Lofren Heritage Range sets the tone for all of our other tiers. The range illustrates the values synonymous with Van Lofren, while offering a clear proposition to our consumers who are looking for the perfect wine to accompany their own rewarding journeys of growth. Supporting the large printed VRL and the updated Van Lofren branding logo is the angled blind embossed VRL detailing that acknowledges the modern and open space of our tasting center in Robertson. Built in 1972, the cold fermentation cellar was a game changer. The original signage on display and the vertical concrete inlay detailing on the cellar's facade is the inspiration for the typeface applied to note each Van Lofren wine's vintage and highest levels of quality. The final piece of the puzzle was the Van Lofren Farm's date of purchase, 1937. The glass panelling leading into the original family home is a reflection of where we have come from and by placing the founding date at the top of the label, it represents the doorway leading forwards towards new experiences and rewarding growth. Van Lofren, 
is more than just a brand. It is a group of passionate people that are collectively responsible for something special. It is in this honest simplicity of our Van Loofren range that we hope to share with you and our consumers the reward of growth. So there you have it. A lot has changed in the last 40 years, culminating in this particular moment. I must go to Philip next and uh, ask you, Philip, you know, how confident are you that uh, this new branding is gonna, will resonate with your consumers? Tony, very excited just to, to see it now again and feel it. Um, we, are, we are confident. Um, I think for many years we've, we've done a lot of good things, but maybe we have not told our stories through our brands and our packaging as strong as we, we could have and, and should have. Um, yes, people love stories, consumers love stories, and, and the whole idea by, by behind this new re relaunch is that our packaging is encapsulating that and our memories and stories live through our, our packaging. You know, the packaging is fantastic. We've just seen it uh, just now. But I suppose one of the key things, Philip, is to retain the quality uh, that you always had before. Yeah, one of the words that are used in wine most often probably is quality with innovation. Um, so quality is imperative. It's, it's, not, it's unnegotiable. Uh, but we do listen to our consumers and we do produce wines that they like and want. And, uh, and, and that means that we have to adapt certain practices within our, our vineyards if that, if that is necessary. Uh, one of our larger benefits is that we, we manage and farm our own vineyards. So we can start 12 months before the harvest, we can already start with pruning techniques, uh, etc., cetera, to, to get vineyards to a certain style of wine, which we will only sell 24 months down the line. So it's a huge integrated process and quality is always an imperative part of that. Well, Philip, you know, what do you think? Do you think the uh, Van Lofren brand was actually uh, neglected or maybe overshadowed because of the success of the Four Cousins brand? I like the word overshadowed more than neglected. Um, both, both play a role. Uh, Four Cousins has been wonderful for us as a business. It has actually accelerated our, our growth and we've had a remarkable change over the past 20 years in so many, many facets. And maybe we have slightly neglected the Van Lofren brand and its story and the heritage. Uh, it is our premium brand, it is our heritage brand, and today is all about, about growth and about the focus on, on where we come from. Um, I think it's important in life to understand where you come from, but it's also important in business to, to understand where you come from. And, and by, by launching this new packaging, we are now putting us up for creating new memories for the future. All right, so you want to make new memories after 40 years in the business. What do you still want to achieve? Achievement uh, is linked to rewards, and for us, rewards is in, in growth. Uh, we see ourselves as custodians within an opportunity, uh, a moment in time, as if I can put it that way. Uh, we acknowledge that we are privileged to have this opportunity, and we want to build on this opportunity and legacy uh, for, for the future. Mm. And uh, if we can grow the business in that process and grow individually and collectively, then uh, with this new packaging and launch, I think we can put Van Lofren at a next level, even though it is, only, it is already after 40 years in the market. Mm. Now, Neil, uh, let me come back to you. I mean, it all starts in the vineyard, doesn't it? And you have quite a footprint at the moment, don't you? Yes, we do. And I think that was about 20, 2009, 2010. We made a decision to grow the business and to be able to do it um, in a very good way, um, to be in charge of your destiny, it all starts on, um, on the farm. So we were quite aggressive the last 10 years, and today we've got a footprint of farms stretching over about 85 kilometers, um, which starts about 70, 80 kilometers from um, Cape Agalas, which gives us extreme big um, area between the Langeberg and the uh, Refis on the Inbergen, where we've got everything a winemaker and a farmer can dream of, every type of soil, every type of um, terroir, um, every little niche um, we could dream of, um, we've got our hands on and um, choices and decisions made to plant vineyards for the future is made um, collectively between the winemaking team and the production team on the soils and the type of um, terror we've got um, to our capability. Now, Bustle, obviously one size doesn't fit all and there's more than just one farm, is there more than just one vineyard? Yes, Tony, I've been fortunate the last 28 years to be on a planning committee with our viticulturists to decide which varietals we will plant at which site to make brand-specific wines from. 
And what is unique about the vineyards at Van Loofren is that we as at our cellars, we can keep each and every block separate up until the end when we bottle, decide on bottling the wine. So Van Loofren should be every winemaker's dream because we've got so many terroirs to pick from and then to experiment at the cellars to make brand specific wines. Okay, fantastic. Uh, now, Neil, I know you've embarked on a major red wine project, which I'm very curious to find out about. And uh, what we did is that we sent Rochelle Liedemann who, to visit the farm Isabo to, to delve a little bit deeper into this particular project with Neil, as well as uh, Francois Fellune, who is a viticulturist from Vinpro. So we're in the heart of the Robertson Valley on this beautiful Isabeau farm. How did this red wine project come about and why? About three years ago, on a Van Hoeven management meeting, um, the decision was made that we must try and increase the quality of all the Van Hoeven red wines in the whole range. The family decided to go and look for a specific red wine farm in, in the country. We went around and started in Marmersbury, Darling oh. and Stellenbosch. And on our way back, we realized that we are looking on the wrong place sure. because there's one of the most special places in the country for sale, Isabo in the De Wip Valley. So we came back and decided to continue in Robertson. So what technologies are being implemented to develop the farm? Well, the first one we used, which for me was very interesting, was drone technology that gives you a terroir analysis of the whole farm. Wow. That gives you the different slopes the different angles, the sunlight radiation, which basically means how many sunlight each different soil type would get through the day. For instance, the one um, field at the back where we planted Cabernet and Cabernet Franc gets four hours more sunlight than we'll get in this vineyard where we're going to plant Pinot Noir, which um, for Pinot Noir is very good because Pinot Noir enjoys more cooler climates. So what management and trellising models are being used? Well, first of all, we planted 37 hectares of pure old cell cell in 2020 and we are very excited. The field behind us is going to be vine by post, which is not done very uh, often in South Africa. Yeah. It's a very expensive um, method that increases quality because it's got a 360 um, sunlight every day. Wow. And it's known for basically the best quality grapes. So Francois, what excites you about this project? Actually, a lot excites me about this red wine project of Van Loofren. What we've already achieved over the last two years um, is amazing. There are actually two legs, two parts of it. Um, there are short-term objectives. We, we want to improve the quality of the existing red wine blocks by doing some adjustments in these blocks, to name a few, uh, the winter pruning, irrigation management practices, crop control, as well as some canopy management practices to enhance the quality of the existing vineyards. The second part of the, the project is a, more the long term. You have to plant the right cultivars, red wine cultivars on the right sites. For premium red wine growing, we need relatively warm days, but cool nights. Um, and that you can't find anywhere. This specific spot where we're standing is one of those special sites. We don't have a problem with warmer days in, in Robertson, yeah. but then this slopes during the nights, there's a flow of cool air down these slopes into these valleys, and that will give you this cooling off effect. And we are very excited about the future of Van Loofren premium red wines. And we're definitely looking forward to that. Wow, that is very impressive. Neil, talk to me about what we just saw. Well, I think one thing we have to remember is that the four of us has been um, connected with the whole process for about for the last 25 years and um, roughly 20, 2009, 2010 when we started this um, growth in the business um, until then we were alone. Um, Eni and myself were on the farm with no production managers and as we grew the business today we've got seven production managers running the farm with us and between them they've got about 220 years of experience and that you don't buy. Um, so we've got a very strong team that um, works with us. And as we said on Van Lofren, no one talks about me or, or we or you. They talk about on the farm as the managers is my farm. Mm. And that is very good as an internal competition between them. Getting a winemaker walking past you, tapping on the back and saying, listen, you and you made this champion block for the year. And um, 
Yet it's a bragging right by the rest of the product production managers would want to go to that guy and ask, how did you do? What did you do extra? And learn through experience and learn through what, what worked for the last um, year. Wow. Uh, now, Basil, talk to me about the actual winemakers themselves. I mean, what makes your winemakers unique? Talk to me about your team. Tony, we've got four winemakers at the moment. If you count me in, it's five. A white winemaker is a curious investigative winemaker. He likes to look and research new trends. A red winemaker is a poetic philosopher. And uh, with our new uh, red wine project, he helps us a lot. And then we've got a young winemaker. He's a perfectionist. And our lady winemaker that's been with us from uh, 2007, she's our Method Cup Classic winemaker and also handles our logistics around bottling. Um, what is nice for me about this team or unique is that when we sit around the wine tasting table, each individual brings his strengths and philosophy to the table while we taste. And when we decide, eventually it takes us, can sometimes take us hours to um, decide on which wine to put, put in the bottle. And um, it gives me peace of mind that when we eventually decide which wine go into which brand specific wine, um, that we put the best in the bottle that Van Lofren's got to offer. Wow. Now, uh, a little bit earlier on, Neil uh, explained, uh, talked to us about the uh, multiple uh, vineyards. And uh, now talk to me, how do you manage, uh, you know, the multiple vineyards with just one winery? Uh, we're fortunate that um, as we grew over the last decade, we've acquired, acquired some new um, wineries. We've actually in the last couple of years moved our red wines to one facility where we age it. And then we've got our Method Cap Classic winery in Bonneville as well. And the last two years, we acquired a red wine facility that helps us quite a lot, especially with our new um, red wine project uh, that we're running now. And then our uh, big facility on the farm is where we tend to most of our, our white grapes. So again, it's unique and um, our winemakers can actually practice what they preach when they say they keep the vineyards separate from the block up, up until the end when we decide on which wine to bottle. And um, what's fortunate in a year like 2021, where there's a bumper crop, a record crop over the whole of the Western Cape, a lot of wineries are struggling to fit in all their grapes and juice in one cellar. Um, we will, f will be fortunate when we finish in two weeks time that we still have about 10% space for some extra capacity. So the winemakers can operate as you normal. Well, look, certainly just uh, like these uh, four gentlemen that are sitting with me right now, also different winemakers with different personalities and specialities. Uh, let's actually now go and meet the team. Rochelle is in the cellars on the farm. Chris, in short, how would you describe the Van Leeuwen winemaking philosophy? For us as Van, Van Leeuwen, every, everything starts in the vineyard. Uh, the goal is to capture the vintage of every cultivar that we harvest. And with 10,000 hectares of vines and coming from different vineyard sites and different terroirs, we are able to produce excellent quality wines. Jacques, your individual style, how does that fit into the Van Leeuwen winemaking philosophy? So Rochelle, definitely something that Van Leeuwen in, encourage is uh, individual style. And as a winemaker, you need to, to, to say what you see. And that is what I see in Van Leeuwen also in the philosophy is really uh, put some skin in the game. And uh, by the end of the evening, yeah, you, you're a bit sticky and a bit juicy, but I mean, you can wash that off and uh, enjoy it with another glass of wine. Chris, what is the advantages, especially having such a large and diverse winemaking team? Yes, we are four winemakers, each with our own unique set of skills. And um, if we know the target or the goal that we are working towards, everybody adds in their own unique way. And we are adaptable to, to changes, changes in the wine industry, changes in wine styles, and also changes from our consumers. Jacques, what is the interaction between the winemaking teams and the vineyards? So we as winemakers and the vineyard team needs to understand you know, what a certain terroir can, can give us. It really starts in, in winter. Make sure that it's pruned to you know, our, our goal. 
uh, growing season, you know, two weekly visits by the winemaking team with, with the vineyard uh, managers. Closer to harvest, you know, it's weekly. Uh, week, weekly visits, making sure that we, we harvest at the right time. And where does the consumer fit into this? We as winemakers, you know, we, we like the vineyards, we like the cellar. We get the opportunity to, to go and present tastings, but with what's going on currently with COVID, you know, that's been lacking. So we rely on the marketing and sales team to bring that information to the table. You need to stay relevant to your market. You need to show your market that you are willing to uh, venture into new directions, bring something new to the table. Fashion changes uh, every, every now and again. Um, it's the opportunity to show yourself in a new way, communicate again your, your values and what is important for you. Um, and I think it's the perfect opportunity for Van for to to show that. Um, with, with this new branding. So diversification is a buzzword in agriculture. It's imperative to stay relevant and also to ensure growth. Now, the uh, question is, how do you innovate within this environment, Philip? Tony, yeah, we are entrepreneurs by heart, uh, but we also look for opportunities within the current business environment. And we were the first 21 years ago to launch a commercial product in a Magnum 1.5 litre bottle, which was Four Cousins. Um, we've discussed it, it has worked brilliantly. Uh, we launched a product Tangle Tree range about 10 years ago in a plastic bottle, polyesterine, recyclable plastic bottle. Um, it's still the only one that's on the mark and viable. Um, so I think that's great innovation, also from a green point of view. Uh, we've been speaking about premium box, two litre and three litre box at a premium price point for many years. So we knew it was coming. Uh, it's happening as we speak. And, uh, and then two years ago, we, we launched uh, Almost Zero and a, and a product uh, Absolute Zero, which is our dealkalized wine, which is, has been a very exciting, mm. uh, in, innovative um, contributor to our business. Uh, and let me go to the winemaker himself. And Basil, what was your initial thought about uh, Almost Zero? Tony, initially it was a, almost a shock to us, but um, expecting anything from our marketing people, uh, we, just, <laughs> we just did it. And um, later after we got emails and letters from happy consumers, uh, we realized how many people there are actually in South Africa that are alcohol intolerant. And um, since then, it also helped us through the prohibition period during COVID financially. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then, we brought out a new brand called Absolute Zero. That's a sparkling wine, which is now my preferred non-alcoholic drink. Okay, I'll try it one day. <laughs> All right, let's, I, want, I want to go back to the subject of diversification, guys. And uh, Henny, let me come to you on this one because you are known, you know, for growing grapes. You're known for making wine, but now you've started, uh, you know, diversifying into other agricultural products. Why, Tony? As you've heard in the Van Lofren stable, we've got many different kind of wines. So now we're going to start diversify into fruit trees. We've planted cherry trees, soft citrus, almonds, and avocado pears. Well, there it is. That's the reason for that diversification. And it all goes far beyond the farm gate. And there's a lot of value to be added in that chain. Uh, the wine industry contributes approximately 55 billion rands to the South African GDP. Wine is the second largest agricultural export product. And wine tourism makes up 7.2 billion rands of this. That's really, really, really astonishing. Now, Philip, you know, what is Van Lovren doing to capitalize on all those numbers I've just churned out? Yeah, it's only big numbers, as you say. Um, research has shown that, that uh, in agriculture, only 10% of the value chain forward goes back to farm gate, as we say. So one of our benefits have always been is that we farm the grapes, we process it, and we can market and sell it. And then when you get to tourism, then you actually interact with your end consumer right at the final point. So from a business perspective, it commercially, it makes sense. But also from a brand building perspective, it is imperative. And uh, that's how we started building Van Lofren brand 40 years ago with our parents doing tastings over weekends individually on the wine farm. And yeah, we've got three lively tasting facilities at the moment with each got the unique attributes. We've got uh, two restaurants where we interact with our, our customers. 
And uh, when the international tourists come back, that, that's also a very important part because we are strong in exports. Exports is one of our, our growth pillars. And when you can sell your product on the local market to a, f- a foreign visitor, hopefully there will be interaction, interaction when they move back uh, to their countries. Uh, yeah, we export to 62 countries, which is quite unique and diverse. Uh, Africa, Asia, Europe uh, and Americas. Uh, the consumers differ, so it's not selling the same product to all of them, although it would be ideal from a, a winemaking and a logistical perspective. Uh, but yes, that is one of our, our, our future growth uh, pillars. Do you find the growth and the, the demand of wine in Africa is, is, is growing? Is there more demand of becoming a, a wine consuming continent? Yes, there is. Africa has always consumed wine. Uh, historically, uh, French wine and Portuguese wine because of the old uh, relationships that there was. Uh, but South Africa is closer. So from a, a geographical point of view, it makes, makes sense that, that we own Africa like uh, South America would work into America and, and that um, Australia and New Zealand would work into China just because the geographics are in place. Uh, and, and as Africa is growing and will continue to grow in the future, that middle class will strengthen and wine consumption will increase. And it is a, it is a great market for us. We are doing well in Africa. I must ask you about uh, the pandemic, COVID-19 has changed so many, so many things, of course, affected so many industries. How has it affected you in the wine industry? I mean, there must be, you know, pros and cons to this. Yeah, it's been catastrophic for, for some businesses. Uh, the fact that we have brands are definitely going to work in our favor. Uh, we have got a, a, a route to market. We do have a channel in which we can sell. Uh, the wineries that, that, as we say, produce bulk wine, unfortunately, are, are not going to have a market for their, their product. And, and the result of, of the decisions that were made uh, has now led to, Bustles men, men, mentioned the bumper crop, but the bumper crop combined with the fact that we were closed in South Africa for close to five months last year from a sales point of view, means that there is a lot of wine lying around in tank that is unsold. So as I, my term that I put it, there will still be blood on the streets in the sense of that wine, there is too much wine that is unsold and that is going to have a, a, a dire impact on certain business models. Well, Philip, you know, during this uh, particularly difficult period that you've just mentioned, COVID-19, the pandemic itself, but uh, as Van Lufren, you guys have actually decided to make a pretty courageous decision. Tony, yes, as I mentioned, that our end consumer is very important to us. Uh, We are a distance from Cape Town and the main city centre, the waterfront, Table Mountain. So we wanted to get something closer to that area and region, especially for the international tourists, but also the local tourists. Both, Both are very important. And we are opening a wine emporium in Stellenbosch at the, at the Route 44 premises uh, shortly. Uh, COVID has brought some challenges within that timing of the decision, but there will be a new normal after this. And we are looking to the future that when the world stabilizes, that foreign tourists will come back and that we will have a very exciting prospect available to them in Stellenbosch. Let's talk a little bit, Philip, about uh, transformation within the South African context. Uh, the success that you've had as uh, Van Lofren as well, I'm sure you're passing that on to your employees? Yes, we have. It's something that we are extremely proud of. Uh, I think we were, again, entrepreneurial in that spirit. Uh, transformation is also one of our, our growth pillars, and we believe that through transformation we can continue to grow. And if you think of the, the year I'm going to mention to you now, it was in 2004 when we started our first project. So, project, so that was 17 years ago and literally way before the curve almost, if I can put it that way, where we decided to positively engage, uh, positively um, initiate and, and develop product projects, which we are very proud of today, projects which are successful. And we've ex- expanded that over the last four or five years to a second and third project. And we've included our, 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 our loyal employees that have been with us for generations. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's different, unique models. And um, it's something that we are very excited about, very proud of. You have to understand that it's always within normal business realities, but you do create a positive discourse. You do create a lot of pride and a lot of trust and, and, and uh, yeah, it just, it just brings the, the, the whole business closer together. Okay, still on that subject now, Rochelle, uh, she paid a visit uh, to some of the shareholders on the farm in Middleburg. It's an inspiring to see what a difference these initiatives actually make in the lives of individuals, in the lives of families, as well as communities at large. Mr. 
Kijkers, en jij is een trotse aandeelhouder bij de Geria in Middelburg. Vertel ons over jouw betrokkenheid over de afgelopen paar jaar en tot dusver. In 2005 uh, het die Retief Neefs van Loberen begon met die project uh, op de Geria. Waar al ons werkers betrokken gemaakt het uh, om aandeel te in de Geria. 2010 is Middelburg gekoop, waar ons 2020 begin boer het, uh, waarvan ik zelf uh, aandeelhouder is op uh, Middelburg. Christian, wat betekent het voor jou om aandeelhouder te wees? Eerstens uh, maakt dat jou baie trots. Ik denk van de achterstand af dat jij geluk niks gaat het nie. En jij wordt bevoorrecht om aandeel te een grond of in de maatschappij. En aan het einde van die dag uh, is het maakt niet trots nie, maar je wordt eindelijk financieel bevoordeeld wanneer de dividend aan het einde van die dag aan je uit, uitgekeerd wordt. Wat hoop jij om één dag na te laten voor je kennis? Omdat ik een aandeelhouder is, is mijn hoop dat hulle ook aan, die, aan die einde van die dag uh, die aandeel kan gebruiken voor onszelf. En niet net uh, die geld daarvan te zien, maar dat het uh, een toekomstige uh, ding zal worden wat ook morgen voor hulle daar kan wees. Livingston, with so many failed transformation initiatives, why do you think there's so much success with the career with Leifberg and now Middelburg as well? It's clear that there's a golden thread that runs through all these three projects. It's based on key business principles. Um, one being due diligence um, that was put after this, into this business plan with realistic for production forecast, um, financial for forecast, risk mitigation um, in terms of diversification. Secondly, um, the whole issue around the long-term commitments, where we would not prematurely extract value out of it too early, but rather ensure sustainability that, that, that will create significant equity for the, for the, for the businesses um, to then uh, maximize future value. And then thirdly, the, the issue around the relationships. It's built on trust. If that relationship is there, um, then, then I think it's easier for all the stakeholders to, to embark on the future. Going with that is the, is, is the contentious issue about mentorship. We are fortunate to, to capitalize on existing expertise um, and capability within the Van Loverens business, for example, who are one of the stakeholders. Um, that helps a lot. Jacob, what does it mean for you to be an aandeelhouder? For me, by Middelburg, is it a good for my family for the long term. And I have two beautiful daughters, so they can one day can go to study. And this is a very beautiful project for the aandeelhouders who are betrokken is by Middelburg. That is incredibly encouraging to see projects that work, projects that are done for the right reasons uh, with real, real results. Well, Philip, how do you guys challenge yourselves, uh, you know, going into the future to continuously grow this brand? Tony, though, this brand, I think, will be a, a easy way of growing it. Uh, creating brands and building brands uh, is different. It's easy to conceptualize something. It's diff difficult to commercialize that conceptualization. Uh, with Van Loofren, we have got a 40-year history. We've got stories. We have memories. And that is something that today we are using to, to build on for the future. Uh, but it is important that the whole team does buy in and, and uh, uh, respects the process. And now, now we've spoken today from production farm managers to the winemaking team, sales and marketing, uh, and then ultimately to our consumer. But then in the middle, you have your trade partners, which are your retail partners, your distributors, and also your importers. And it's very important that they also feel and buy into our story, uh, that they understand what we try and, and sell and, and commercialize, and it also works in their business and their environment. And uh, if we can get all those working at the same time, then we will be able to grow this brand in the future. Okay, before we get to the Q&A part, let me just get a couple of tips from you guys. Uh, Henny, what's a, what's a good wine uh, to go with my steak? Steak? Yeah. Our Van Lufren Cabernet Sauvignon, mm -hmm. all our red wines. But if you don't like red, you can take a white, a white Sauvignon Blanc. Okay, well, what's, what's your favorite, Abbasel? The winemaker himself. Well, as a drinking wine uh, without any food, I prefer white wine mm -hmm. to beer, and uh, therefore I consume a lot of Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> and um, if, if we talk food, 
Um, Cabernet is my favorite. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Neil, which do you consume a lot? And I know <laughs> I said a lot. <laughs> um, well, Sauvignon Blanc as well. And yeah. the Retief Cay Blend is my favorite red. All right, it's time now for our Q&A session. Now having these four gentlemen, the third and current Fundal Offering generation together on the set is an opportunity to engage, an opportunity not to be missed. So we'd like you to keep on engaging with us. And uh, we've already got a few questions coming in. So let's start with uh, James uh, from JL Marketing. James is in South Africa. And gentlemen, James is asking a very simple question. When will we get to see this new packaging in store? Okay, Tony, I'll, I'll take that one. Hi, uh, James, good to hear from you. Yeah, uh, trust all is well there down in the Cape. Uh, we had uh, dinner last night. Uh, we stayed over at City Lodge and we had a glass of wine and the uh, Van Lofren Chardonnay Pinot Noir Daydream was available in the new packaging. So some of it is out on the shelf already. But to be fair to the market, uh, let's say that we are hoping that through the, the pipeline it will all be available by June latest, all, all the, the SKUs. All right, we have an, an, another question coming from Pretoria, uh, from Ronel. Now, Ronel's asking a simple question. Actually, Neil, a little bit earlier on, you you, you mentioned we spoke about uh, the Red Wine Project. Uh, Ronel wants to find out when will, actually, will we see product in bottle? Well, um, <clears throat> as we said, it's um, the short-term version is into the 2020 harvest um, in the red wines would be um, bottled this year. And Isabo would be harvested the first time in 2022. So reckon 2023, the Isabo product will be in the bottle. But um, the Red Wine project is running continuously. Okay. All right. Now we continue with the questions. And remember, please engage with us. We want to hear if you have any questions uh, for uh, the four gentlemen that are in studio with me. We've got one coming through from uh, Mark. Yeah, he uh, wants to know, gentlemen, how do you actually harness water or use water responsibly? Hi, Mark. Uh, all our water and irrigation are computerized. Um, we've got probes in the vineyards with which we can see how wet and how dry the soil is. And by using these instruments, we can control our water use and not over irrigate. Well, let's go straight into another question here. We've got one from Emil Hubert. He's asking, how sustainable is the local market in terms of unlocking value, seeing that 85% of all wine sold in South Africa is under 45 rand a litre? Uh, Philip, you want to take that one? Tony, yeah, that's a, a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a tough one. Uh, I think I should invite Emil for a coffee at the winery yeah. because there's a, there's a short and a long answer. Uh, but yes, it is a concern that so much of our wine is sold at, at low prices, even at 45 rand a litre, it is still sustainable, depending on your vineyard, vineyard models, etc. I think the real concern is the wine that's sold even way below uh, that value, and there are huge volumes for that. And I think as an industry, mm -hmm. we need to, to do some into retrospective uh, investigation as to, especially post-COVID, are we going to uh, create a sustainable future for yeah. our industry? As an industry. As an industry, yeah. Okay. Listen, let's go to another question here from wine.co.za. Uh, it's a pretty simple question. How many people does uh, Van Lofren employ? Who wants to take that one on? Yeah, roughly, roughly about 400. Yeah. 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 And permanent workers, employees, and then yeah, seasonal, quite, quite a few extra. Okay. Yeah. Um, another one here from Emil Hubert. He says, will the new brand also herald a greater focus on exports? And will the focus be on varieties or on blends? If so, what varieties? Who's going to take that one on? I, I'll do the, the exports and Basel can do the, mm -hmm. the varieties. Okay. Uh, yes, Emil, uh, exports is one of our growth pillars, as we've, as we've said. Um, important part of our business. And I, th I think the new packaging and the new look and feel definitely will enhance our export uh, opportunities in, in, in many markets uh, yeah. with a fun different range. Okay. Uh, Basel on the, on, the, on the blends? Yes, Emil, the um, focus will be on, on, on varietals. Mm -hmm. And um, then we've got that uh, one Cabernet. Um, Merlot blend that we're also focusing on. Okay. Uh, back to the questions. Uh, this one's from uh, Johan Crawford. He says, ask uh, any new or less common varieties in the in the pipeline for Van Lofren? Neil? Well, um, <clears throat> we've got um, Isa Oliver, which is a muscat grape. Mm -hmm. um, the privilege or the advantage of that is, is um, lengthening our harvesting season, because that's two, three weeks earlier than um, most uh, grapes. And then um, we've got Cabernet Franc for the first time. Um, 
DRF, Petit Chiraz, um, all building blocks for the Red Wine project. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Elvina Snell Fortein, she's uh, asking, what would you say as the is the uh, Van Lofren brand's biggest challenge? Uh, I would say the biggest challenge is the competitive uh, environment that we operate in. I mean, there are strong other brands as well. We are not the only ones. Mm -hmm. There are many wineries out there. Uh, it is probably the most fragmented industry uh, of all consumer products that, that does exist. Yeah. So, so that would be our, our, our biggest uh, challenge and opportunity. How do we, how do we grow within, within that environment? Mm. I suppose here's another question that I suppose speaks to uh, one of the challenges that you face. And the simple question is how are you dealing uh, with global warming? Let's I'll take, take that one. I'll, I'll take that one. Okay. Mm. Um, we've got uh, on the cellar roofs, we've got 202 kilowatts of uh, solar panels. That supplies about 20% of the electricity in the cellar. Then we also harvest half our crop during the night. So our juice comes in cold, so we also need less energy to cool down the juice. Um, our pumps or irrigation are all uh, computerized with probes in the land, so we, can s uh, so we don't over-irrigate, we don't use uh, too much um, electricity. Mm -hmm. And another one is our Tangle Tree bottle, our PET bottle, that uh, is a low carbon footprint. Mm. That's, that's four things. Okay. Uh, a last question here coming from uh, Graham Hull. He says, um, which red and white varieties are your signature ones in flagship wine? Uh, will these heroes change with the new branding? Um, gentlemen? Well, uh, Graham, I'll, uh, I'll ask that one, Tony. Mm -hmm. um, will these heroes change? Um, no, because we've, we've, we listen to our consumers and we've got a, a huge following on certain of our brand uh, varietals as well. For instance, our Java Pinotas, we've got a huge following in South Africa. And for me to go and tweak that wine now uh, is not going to happen. Mm. Although the label changed, the quality of that wine won't change. And then um, mm -hmm. on the uh, white varieties, our uh, strong brand will still be the Sauvio Blanc. And on the red, it will be the Cabernet Sauvio. All right. Okay, thank you so much uh, to everybody for uh, those questions, uh, but uh, s still stay with us. I just want to get a, a closing comments from the gentleman here. Uh, starting with you, Philip, what does the future hold? Tony, um, yeah, we are South Africans. We are vested in South Africa. Uh, we are going to stay here. Uh, we want to make uh, our region, our area, a better place by, by growing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the, the, future, the future is exciting and we, we know all about our, our challenges as a country. Yeah. Uh, within that, we, we will continue operating and uh, I think we've, we've, we've shared a lot today of, of who we are and our plans and uh, yeah, we are positively looking to the future. Okay, Neil? Well, I think um, quality-wise for the future, we're very excited for everything um, in the soil now and the project in the future forward building um, the backbone of the Van Lofren wines. Mm. Uh, Henny, I'm not going to leave you out of this one. Closing comment, please. <laughs> <laughs> to me, yep. I would say we must start, we're going to continue on building brands. Mm -hmm. uh, Bustle? Uh, I hope the four of us will um, be able to give over to our children successfully yeah. and then that we can all have a lot of grandchildren. <laughs> okay, uh, I love that all. I have a lot of grandchildren. <laughs> Fantastic, guys. It's, it's been a, a great morning. It's been great fun. I'm sure so many people have learned so much about uh, uh, the legacy and, you know, the, the brand going forward. Thank you so much for I inviting me to, to join you for this, uh, you know, looking looking ahead uh, to the Van Lofren brand. Thank you so much. Uh, we also want to thank all those who've uh, managed to join us this morning as well. Thank you for taking the time and uh, I'm sure you'll continue to be part of the Phil Lofren family uh, going ahead. I'm sure you've learned a lot about the Retief uh, boys. I've been calling them boys throughout the morning uh, as well. So well, what can I say? It's been a privilege to revisit one of South Africa's greatest success stories in the wine sector and to relive the Van Lofren journey and I'm sure the next chapter will continue to surprise us all. Van Lofren is a growing family business, as you've heard. It's rooted in the South African wine industry with a vision to create successful brands, to stay innovative and to be sustainable for future generations. That's key. And I'd also like to say that uh, they are well on course to realizing that vision. We've heard all of that 
throughout this morning. But please stay tuned. We'll bring you some funny moments to get to know the Ratifs a little better uh, that we managed to pick up uh, during the last couple of weeks from us here in studio. It's uh, goodbye. And in just a moment, um, I've been promised that we'll properly celebrate the occasion with a good uh, Von Lofren sparkling wine. They're sitting right there on the table in front of us. And I get to pick uh, whichever one I want. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. And thank you uh, for joining us this morning. Yeah. <laughs> 